privilege for me to introduce Pastor Jacob Chelian. I studied in Southern Asia Bible College and he was the Dean of Southern Asia Bible College, Bangalore. And so I feel it's my honor to introduce him first. He has been teaching the Bible for almost 40 years. He's a professor of New Testament at Southern Asia Bible College. His passion is to teach all those who seek to follow Christ how to understand the Bible. He studied New Testament studies at Princeton Theological Seminary, U.S. So with this short introduction, let me go to today's talk. Today's talk is about how to interpret Bible in this time of pandemic. You know, during this time of pandemic, people try to speak of all sorts of things. They say that maybe it is because of God's judgment. The world is going to end. Somebody said July 29th, the world will end. So in another 10 days, we may all die. So with all these thoughts, we are here now with our speaker who is going to speak on this very important topic. And also I request him to pray for our helpline connect. You know, for the past one month, we have integrated our app, web app with the counselors and our prayer warriors. So we have around 50 counselors and uh, prayer warriors and we have integrated the app. So if you call us, the app automatically will assign the counselors and prayer warriors based on your specialities. So let me share my screen and explain. So this is our DRM web app. So if you are a volunteer, you will have this web app in your mobile or in your desktop. We will give you the login and the password. So everything about the Rice movement is to give voice to the voiceless and hope for the hopeless. The main motto is freely we have received and freely we will give. The vision is to raise a banner of hope, rescue the abused, and to rise up as world changes. The mission is to bring abundance of life to the brokenhearted, to advocate for children, women, men, and families in a traumatic and life-threatening situation, and to break the fetters of evil with prayer networks across the globe, functioning as the hands and feet of Jesus Christ with God's word as the central tent. You know, we have two types of uh, ways people can reach out. The first one is the prayer line. We have taken this number, 8801858585, and in four languages, Tamil, English, um, Hindi, Canada, we have prayer warriors and counselors who would uh, speak with you and who would listen to you. And next way, you can contact us through our website, debrarice.org. So we have this contact form. If you want prayer, you will have what are the special needs you have. And if you have counseling, if you want counseling, for what reason you need counseling, everything is there. Once you fill and submit, we will get it and the app will automatically assign with the help of super admins. And now our counselors are very confidential. So you can be bold enough to tell your problems and nothing will be discussed in our groups or with one another. And uh, we have volunteers who support both the prayer lines and the counseling lines. We do gender specific counseling and we have many female counselors and male counselors and similarly female prayer warriors and male prayer warriors. The counseling specialities are a child and adolescent counseling, premarital, marital, couple and family counseling, counseling and mentoring youth, sexual assault and abuse, addiction, alcoholism and drug abuse, crisis, grief, trauma, and loss of loved ones, depression and anxiety-related disorders, domestic violence, gender identity confusion, and LGBTQs. And coming to prayer, you can ask prayer for how to become closer to God. And uh, some people, if they don't have children, we can pray with them for family problems, for financial breakthrough, for health and healing, even for peace of mind or sleep disorders, for to get the right marriage partners, for studies, for scoring good marks, and for many more. We are here to be with you, to hold hands with you, and to pray. And the Lord of heavens will answer our prayers. So with this short introduction of our web app, 
Now, over to you, Dr. Jacob Cherian. Let's first of all pray for this uh, really creditable, really good effort trying to help people in counseling and prayer. So let's just pray, take a moment all together and pray for this helpline that has been planned. I am grateful to God for these uh, many, many people who are willing to give of their time sacrificially for helping the needy. Father in heaven, we thank you that you are the God of all compassion. You're the God of grace and mercy and peace. And through our Lord Jesus Christ, and through the work of the Holy Spirit, working through yielded servants of yours, Lord, you seek to bring healing to our world. So I pray for your great blessing, Lord, on all those who are going to be involved in ministering to the needy that will that will approach through this uh, through this line. Father, we pray that your blessing, your healing, your strength would come to them, and that many many people will testify of the great miracles done in their life through your Holy Spirit. So we commit this and dedicate this helpline in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good evening, friends. We are in a world where we are talking to people, though we cannot see them. We may see on the screen their names or their images, uh, and yet, uh, rarely can we see most people for good reasons, and that's fine. I, uh, if it was a class, I could insist on people putting on their videos, but that's all right. Uh, let me begin by doing a presentation, probably taking about uh, 25 minutes so that some time is left over after that for uh, you to have questions and the questions will be moderated. Uh, they will be asked and I will do my best to respond to that. Thank you once again for joining in friends. Uh, I know all of us have many other things to do, but just that shows uh, that there is something God is doing in your lives. Uh, God is guiding you to follow Jesus and you have a desire to know and to, the Bible better. So. I want to share with you very simply uh, the result of so many years of my own progress. A lot of what I share with you, friends, I have learned through the hard way, meaning I went another way before I learned, which is the right way. So many of the things I'm sharing with you, I did not know myself. I made mistakes. So I want to uh, share with you today. Uh, you, if you have a notebook or a Bible there, you're welcome to make notes. And I'm going to start sharing my screen. Yes, I have the permission here. And um, Yes, I think I think we are set, right? Um, Sister Lata, I think we can see clearly. You can hear me clearly. Yes, yes. Yeah, thank you. So let me go ahead. Let me start with what we have here. How should we interpret the Bible? Let's me uh, just go ahead, give give the presentation, and we we will try and give you enough time uh, today to answer some of those questions of yours. And I hope as we go along, maybe some of your questions will also be answered. So the first thing I want to say is there are some basic principles of interpreting the Bible. There are basic principles of interpreting any reading, any writing, in fact, any communication, even if it is not written down. That is something we all know. And let me put it this way, the good news, the first thing. The good news is that Actually, all of us know how to interpret. I don't have to teach you how to interpret because you already know how to interpret. For example, when this little child, let's call her Anita. Anita is called by her mother. The way her mother calls out to her, Anita knows what the mother is intending, what has happened, the tone of voice, etc. So the good news is most of us, we know how to interpret things when somebody speaks to us or uh, non-verbal communication, whatever. That's the good news. Now, there is a bad news. The bad news is 
Many times our interpretations of the Bible are not correct. They are not always correct or accurate or consistent. Here you see the cover of a book that was written a few years ago by a very intelligent man. He was a NASA scientist, Eric Quisenant. You can go on Wikipedia and read about him. And he wrote an interesting book. Do you see the title of it? 88 Reasons Why the Rapture Will Take Place in 1988. Now, being an intelligent man does not necessarily help you to understand the Bible. It will help to some extent, but you have to learn the basic principles of uh, interpretation. So this man, with his way of reading the Bible, came up with not one or ten, 88 reasons. And he was so sure. And four and a half million copies of this book were sold. Can you imagine the confusion? What happens after 88? Well, he wrote another book, 89 Reasons Why the Rapture Will Be in 1989. And by that time, not so many copies were sold. Why do we make this mistake? Even intelligent people, why don't we get the Bible right? And the reason is, we all look at the text or texts in our Bible with our own glasses. I'm sure you have heard of this ancient story that is found in many cultures of six blind people who went and were trying to figure out what is this thing. They, they were all trying to touch different parts of the elephant. You have heard the story. And depending on which part of the body they touched, they came up with different conclusions. You see, we all tend to look at things partially blind. So we look at one aspect and we make a declaration. Oh, it's a rope or it's a tree or it's a fan or it's a snake or it's a spear. Hello. We are all aware of this kind of mistake that we do. So the first thing to remember, one of the first things to remember is when you use the word Bible, the word Bible is an English word and the word Bible actually means the book, a book. It means one book, but actually the Bible is not a book. It is a collection of many writings of different types. There are what we call literary styles in the Bible. Obviously, when you read Psalms, you read Psalms and then you read Book of Acts. They are not the same genre. That's the literary word used. Genre. G-E-N-R-E. -E. They are different types of writings. So when you read different types, you don't expect them to say things the same way. Also, there are literary devices in the Bible. Uh, for example, when Jesus speaks, the kingdom of heaven is like, what has he done? He has used a simile. Or when he says, I am the true vine. What has he done? He has used a metaphor or sometimes he will use a hyperbole. That is, he will say something like, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. That's exaggeration. That's a literary device. So in the scripture, you are right, reading writing. Remember, it is a collection of all kinds of writing from different periods. And this is important to realize that scripture is written by God's people. God did not write scripture. God did not write the writings of the Old or New Testament. But we still call it God's word because it is given in human words because God's people wrote it and is written in context, in history, in time and space. So important to know that you are now reading a kind of writing which is both human and divine. God is supervising the writing of scripture. So another uh, thing to remember is when you read your chapter divisions in the Bible, these chapter divisions came only in the 1200s. So John does not know there is a John 3.16. So keep this in mind because these were put in later into the Bible, 1200s AD. The other thing to remember, the verse divisions. Sometimes they are not in the best place. These were introduced only in the middle of the 16th century, in the 1550s. So keep all these things in mind when you're reading the Bible. That chapter divisions, verse divisions were put by Paul did not know that Philippians has got four chapters, right? So keep all these things in mind. The next thing to remember is about Bible translation. 
many times people do not understand the challenge of translating from one language to the other. They know it. If you are in a church where people translate from one language to the other, you know how difficult that is. And to realize that all Bible translations, translators are sincerely trying to do their best to translate the Old Testament from Hebrew, mostly, and from Greek, the New Testament, into our different versions. So all versions are good. They are different. There are limitations of each version. And so it's not easy moving from one language to the other. Here in the image, I'm trying to portray the story when Jesus in John chapter 2 verse 4 says to his mother, um, woman, and we have interesting translations in our own languages, which doesn't, they don't look respectful to the mother when you call her woman. Now remember one thing, that Jesus was not speaking in English. Well, he was not even speaking in Greek. He said something to his mother in Aramaic, but the writer writes it in Greek, but the word that he uses there, gunai, is a respectful word in Greek. But the problem comes when you translate from one culture to another, that respect is difficult to translate. That's why in some Indian languages, like Telugu and Kannada, it says amma, mother, it doesn't say woman. So these are the challenges involved in Bible translation. Then there are issues about manuscripts, but I don't have time for that right now. Let's go to the next thing. And this is a very important idea about the Bible. Many people say the Bible is the inspired word of God. And they are actually referring to a certain passage, one translation, or inspired. Spire is to do with breath. Inspired means breath coming in. That's why somebody dies, we say expire. So the breath has gone out. So what does this mean? God's breath coming inside the Bible, writings of the Old Testament. Paul is writing about, talking about the scriptures, meaning the Old Testament. There was no New Testament when Paul is writing, right? So how does God's breath go in? Does God have lungs? No. So then what is it about? It is a metaphor. And for that, any Bible reader will remember Genesis 2-7, where it says God breathed on the humans and they had life. So the word inspiration of the Bible is not, does not mean dictation. That is there in another religion where they believe that the, their writings were dictated by God. We believe that the Bible was written by God's people, but in a sovereign way, they are life-giving. If interpreted well, they can also injure and harm people. There are many examples one can give of how bad interpretation is harms people. So the Bible is a life-giving book if we handle it responsibly. The next thing and the most important um, point that today I would like to say is the meaning of anything and especially a biblical text must come only from its context. The original meaning from its context. So I want to explain this. I mean, anyone will say a man standing with his uh, hand held high and the finger raised. What does that mean? Well, if it's a preacher behind a pulpit, it has a different meaning. But if it's on a cricket field and the umpire lifts his finger like that, all of us who know about cricket understand what that means. So meaning always comes from context. And this is the most important lesson to remember when you read your Bible. Many people want to God to speak to them and open the Bible and a verse. Now, let me say God in his mercy sometimes may speak to us that way, but that is not a trustworthy way for God to be speaking to us. Uh, all right. So what is the basic principle? I want you to think of one simple word. A I M. And I'm using this simple word aim. Before you shoot, better take aim. Now, I'm using it as an acronym for author's intended meaning. Okay, so when you're reading Paul, ask the simple question. Paul is writing this. What is he intending to say? When you're reading any book on the Bible, the original writer has an audience. Next question. What is the audience getting out of this? Audience's inducted meaning. What do they understand? Now, if you can ask this, this is like a litmus test. Remember in high school, we studied about litmus paper. 
you put that into a solution and you find out whether it's alkaline or uh, alkaline or acidic, right? From the change of color. This is a litmus test. So ask the simple question. Could the original reader have meant this? Or could the original intended audience for whom the message was originally, Paul did not write to us. He had no idea we will be reading it in our in so many languages. He wrote a letter to the Philippians, for example. But God, in his wisdom, allows certain letters of Paul and other writings get together. The church later on puts it, now we have a New Testament. Same way the Old Testament. So, remember AIM. What is it? Author's intended meaning and audience's inducted meaning. Now, I want to use another acronym. ABC. I like to make things simple because I feel you don't need to be a rocket scientist you don't need to have a PhD to understand the Bible and to follow Jesus. However, if you learn basic principles like simple ABC, you can better understand scripture. And let me explain what I have been doing for some time now with ABC. A for apple, B for banana, C for coconut. What do I mean by that? Here's a simple diagram. I'm actually condensing in a capsule form what I have been sometimes in my classroom with my students, a few of them are here, uh, sometimes takes for several days. I trouble them and trouble them for a long time before I be come to that. Now, what is this? The first thing at the first level is when you read a text, remember to read it in its literary context. So when you're reading Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Please read the verses before that also. Don't read a verse. The disease that most of us have, we have all inherited this, is called versitis. Versitis. And that means we just take a verse, whether even if it is not even a full sentence. Because sometimes the verse divisions are such that four or five you know, verses actually are one full sentence. So, first level, read the verses before, behind. You will understand the text better. Secondly, the context. Think about the historical and the cultural context. B for banana. How do you eat a banana? You don't eat what you see. You peel the banana in the same way. Learn to peel the historical, cultural context a little bit, as best as you can. Many times you may have to look at other parts of the Bible to understand that. That's B. What is C? How do you open a coconut? You cannot open a coconut with your bare hands. You cannot de-husk it with your bare hands. Usually what do we do? We use some instrument. We don't say, no, unless I open it with my bare hands, I won't have a coconut. No, all of us use instruments. And that is what I mean by certain parts of the Bible to understand the context. The Bible itself doesn't mention it. So, you need somebody who knows that context. Now, please understand, while you as a new reader of the Bible, not the original reader, reads it, you need this extra help. The original readers don't need it. The original readers don't need it, okay? So, but you, because there is a distance and uh, you need to be willing to find, and there are plenty of help today. In fact, especially with uh, the internet and Google, there are simple things you can find out in a minute. So keep this in mind. The first level is literary. I'm going to give, give you quickly two, three examples of each, or maybe one or two examples. The first example is, yes, I just mentioned it, Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. And we go on saying so many things about this. Preachers love this verse and we like the verse. But please read it in the context. If you read from verse 4, uh, chapter 4, verse 10 to 13, you realize it's not about doing anything and everything. It is a specific, it has a specific purpose and meaning. Paul is saying, I have learned the secret of being content in all situations, whether well-fed or hungry. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. So this is talking about contentment, not about doing anything and everything. I still remember many years ago, uh, more than 40 years ago, when I came as a student, I wrote this verse on the file, the, my Greek file. I, I say, I, somebody said, Greek is tough. So I wrote this verse, I can do all things. So I was talking about, I can study Greek <laughs> with the strength of God. Now that's okay. That's all right to begin with. But this is not about learning Greek or doing something. It is about contentment, which by the way, 
is not an easy lesson to learn. Many of us are not yet learned that lesson, but we can in Christ Jesus. The second example I want to give you is found in John 10.10 10 and the first part. The thief comes to steal, to kill, to destroy. And how often we have said that this is all about the devil, Satan, exactly. Now, I give it, yes, the thief, Satan is a thief. Satan has come to steal, kill, destroy. But what is Jesus saying here in John 10? If you look at John 10 verse 1 itself, he talks about the thief. John 10 1, it says the thief is the one who doesn't want to come through the gate. And Jesus will say, I'm the gate. So who is not coming through Jesus? Who doesn't want to listen to Jesus? Read chapter 9. It is the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. So Jesus is referring to the bad religious leaders who are like the bad shepherds of Israel. And in comparison to them, he says, I am the good shepherd. You can go back and, and, and look at uh, even Ezekiel 34, where it talks about the bad shepherds of Israel. God is so fed up with the leaders, spiritual leaders of Israel, that he says, I will personally go and be their shepherd, because these shepherds are not doing the job. So, here he comes. Jesus has come. And then he says, I am the good shepherd. So, look at that in his context. It will change so many ways we look at it without the context. So, that's the first level. Remember, eating an apple, you look around and just eat it. But look around. If you just look at one verse and decide what it is without looking at the context, we don't do that in real life. But we do that with the Bible. Somehow we think every verse has got the same level of importance. It is not so. That, that does not work. Now let me show you one example of peeling a banana. That means when you look at the cultural historical context. An example is this, from Deuteronomy 22, verses 9 to 11. There are three laws there. One law says, don't plant two kinds of seeds, like these grape seeds, as you can see, two varieties of grapes in the same vineyard. Don't wear wool, uh, clothes of wool and linen mixed together. Don't plow, like in this picture, with two animals, different animals, an ox and a donkey. And the question you will ask is why? Why were the Israelites told not to do that? And many times we will spiritualize and say believer, unbeliever should not meet, etc. Well, what God is telling them is they are living in Canaan. And the Canaanites had certain views about gods and goddesses. Their view was all the fertility comes from the Canaanite gods. They were called Baal. Baal and in plural Baals. Okay, they were male gods, but they always had their consorts, female goddesses. They were called Asherahs or Ashtoroth. You may remember that when you're reading the Old Testament. So basically they believed you have to somehow trust in the Baals and Ashtoreth to give you blessing of the land. So even when you plow, don't just plow with two same type of animals. Take two different animals. Why? This is called sympathetic magic. These are the fertility rites of the Canaanites. They represent Baal and Astoreth. So plow with an ox and a donkey. And God told them, don't follow the fertility rites of the Canaanites. Now, this is the cultural background. Same way to understand the parable of the Samaritan. We have always uh, you know, been calling it Good Samaritan. And that's a bad title, I'm sorry to say. That's not the way Jesus was saying. Jesus was saying, you people hate Samaritans. And this is a parable found in Luke chapter 10. Read the end of chapter 9, how the disciples wanted to kill, kill all the people in one Samaritan village. You see, even disciples hate Samaritans. So the whole point of that parable is not about loving your neighbor, any neighbor, any stranger. No, we use that today, I know in English, good Samaritans. But Jesus is saying, the one who wants to kill you, you serve them. If you want to follow me, then you serve your enemy. That is the post, the, the, that's not the parable of the good Samaritan. It's a parable of the good enemy. All right. So that is the second level, the cultural level. The third level is what we can call the coconut level. Now, for example, you come to John chapter 10, verse 22. There it will say, now the feast of dedication had come. 
Now, the moment you read that, you ask a question, maybe you do, what is this feast of dedication? And there is no mention of it either in the Old Testament or in the New Testament. How do you then find out what it is? Well, very simple. Now you have Google or you have a study Bible. It will tell you there was a festival that began around 164 BC. So about 200 years from the time of Jesus. And the temple that was desecrated by the Seleucids, Antiochus Epiphanes IV and others, that temple, the Maccabeans fought for it. That's where you read about the Maccabean Wars. And after they took over the temple and got rid of the Seleucids, they cleansed the whole temple and they rededicated the temple. And that rededication of the temple is also celebrated as Hanukkah. Usually Hanukkah and Christmas, the days are very close together in December. And so they were celebrating the rededication of the temple. Now, what's so, so what? You, well, you have no idea what this thing is there without the help of some extra notes, extra footnote or a study Bible. There is no mention of this because this happens between the testaments. But if you understand this, then you will understand verse 36, where Jesus says, you people are talking about dedication of rededication of this building. But you, do you recognize the one the father has dedicated, set apart? Jesus is saying, really, what is more important is me. I am the temple that the father has dedicated. That's why in John's gospel, in chapter 2 itself, Jesus says, I am the temple. Destroy this temple and I will rebuild it in three days. You see that? So, understanding the Bible is all about getting the context. Some parts of the context you will get very easily by looking just the verses before it and after it. Other parts of the context you will know little more of the Bible you need to learn. The culture, geography, etc. And some parts of the Bible you need a little help. Not too much. A simple Bible dictionary or a simple Bible commentary or even a Wikipedia will help you to figure out the larger context. And when you get context, you get the text. That is why many times we make a blunder about things. So therefore, I want to quickly talk about two unhealthy ways of reading the Bible and then I will talk about two healthy ways of reading the Bible and by that time you can have your questions ready we will talk about it. Two unhealthy ways of reading the Bible. Obviously, the first one is when you just take a Bible verse as almost like a talisman, like a in a tabiz or something like that. Just you expect it to do wonders. Bible verse, keep it somewhere in, you know, um, keep your Bible under your pillow, you will not have bad dreams, that kind of thing. I mean, God sometimes in mercy understands our views. But many times we just take a one verse. For example, let me give you two examples. Psalm 91. And as you can see in that uh, amulet, it is carved, Psalm 91 is carved onto that metal piece. And then you wear it. So somehow you, you think you'll get the protection of some of God of Psalm 91. Or people want to use, uh, by his stripes we are healed or by his wounds we are healed. Do you realize that no, it's not even one verse in your Bible. It's one fourth of a verse. So we are not getting the main point when we just use that by his stripes we are healed. We don't even read the full passage to understand what is happening there. And when we use a Bible like this, we can be very, very disappointed. You know, last year, when the pandemic was beginning, there were pastors and preachers who would say something like, you know, Psalm 91 will keep us away from COVID. Or the blood of Jesus will save you from COVID. The blood of Jesus is my vaccine. There were things like that. The challenge is so many of God's servants who clearly believed in the blood of Jesus, what God's wonderful servants, some of them, succumbed to COVID. So this, using the Bible like this, is does not work and it is dangerous when we don't realize how to use the Bible. The second danger or bad way or unhealthy way of reading the Bible is, and this is very common, 
reading present things happening into the Bible. So you're reading the Bible. I have done this so many times. That's why I told you from the beginning. These are things I have learned, friends. I made these mistakes many, many times over along the way I learned. When you read into the Bible, Antichrist is what is happening in the European Union today. Sometimes they will say the Pope is the Antichrist, or Obama is the Antichrist, Saddam Hussein is the Antichrist, or Roman Catholic Church is there, or whatever. We are reading what is what we see today. We assume all that is prophesied in the Bible. And that is a certain reading of Revelation. And we will talk about that also uh, a little bit. When you read the Bible, listen to what God is speaking to you from the Bible. Don't tell the Bible what to think. Don't read into the Bible. There is a technical word and I don't want to use it for this uh, right now. So, for example, reading into the Bible, I gave you one example earlier of the man who read 88 reasons from his time and period. Here is another man who wrote many such books and made a lot of money and confused a lot of people. Hal Lindsay kept on writing. 80s, something is going to happen. 90s, something is going to happen. There were preachers, you know, I started preaching from the age of, uh, in, from 1978. And I remember saying these things myself. And preachers were there who were sure Jesus will come before 2000. All those who are a little older in this group will remember that. Why? Because we are reading into the Bible what is happening in our time. This is a huge and a popular blunder. There are people who have spent money, millions of dollars, trying to tell the whole world this is how it happened. Basic mistake. For example, this is another thing that the pandemic is God's judgment. And I know it is easy to say this, friends, as long as the judgment does, has not touched your family. And when it doesn't touch your family, you can talk about God's judgment. But when a beloved pastor is gone because of COVID, or a sudden, not just COVID, anything, a sudden heart attack, unexpected, cancer, died in an accident, plane crash. We, is it God's judgment every time? So we have to be very, very careful when we look at one text somewhere and from there make a whole argument that this is God's judgment. Okay, we are living in a broken world and I'll say some more about that. Vaccine connected to the beast of revelation. Ah, <laughs> this, this is also going on a lot. Uh, and I would like to say for those who are writing it down, write down there's a, there, there is a, sim, there are many, many, many good videos about this uh, by people who are sensibly interpreting scripture. There is one by a man called Curtis Chang, C U R. T-I-S, Curtis Chang, C-H-A-N-G, on the vaccine and the beast. Listen to that. There are many uh, in that series. Friends, the beast, what is this beast in Revelation 13, 18? Remember, this book is written for first century Christians. There were no idea of vaccines at those times. We have been doing anything in our time. We saw computers. That was called this thing. Um, the World Wide Web was called the beast. Uh, and because www and they said www stands for in the hebrew wow 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 sound and wow in hebrew is the sixth letter so people found so many interesting ways to say this is the antichrist that is the antichrist and that is missing the whole point in the first century there were no computers there were no televisions so what is the message to them it is a very simple thing it was the name of Nero written down in a certain way. Nero, if you write that word Kaiser, Nero, Kai, Neron, Kaiser, in Hebrew, each letter has a numerical value. And you add that and you get 666. So it was a code way of saying the Hitler of that time was Nero. Just like today, people use the word Hitler. Do you know that Hitler, the number for Hitler is 88? There are people who tattoo the, the number 88 on their head because they are white supremacists. Why 88? Because in English, the letter H is the eighth letter. So HH is Hail Hitler. So people have been using numbers symbolically. 666 
there is nothing about uh, you know vaccine or computers or any of the things we talk about today 666 was an image of the evil roman empire now there are evil empires around the world that can happen every time but originally this is not a prophecy about our time okay a basic mistake missing the original context that's why we miss the bible if only we keep asking the good question so what did this mean to the original readers not to you and me after we have understood that then we ask the question okay now what do we learn from this how do we learn something from this that's the next question don't put the cart before the horse okay that is from the olden times when the horse was there to pull the cart okay before automobiles so don't put first you try to figure out what did the original author mean author's intended meaning what did the original audience understand audience inducted meaning then ask the question because the bible is relevant relevant does not mean it is talking directly to us in our time and why should it be only our time why not 100 years before us why not 100 years after us so this is a very interesting thing that we all think that in our time jesus has to come why could int have come 100 years ago that kind of question okay so two healthy ways of reading the bible very quickly what is the way to read the bible obviously reading the context recognize that the life giving role of the bible the scriptures but they have to be understood in their context and secondly we need to understand it with their own limitations you see the bible has its limitations the bible was not meant to do everything the bible is not everything we don't just tell our children you don't need to go to church i mean school high school no need to study mathematics history geography science physics chemistry biology all you need is a bible no we don't do that we would not be using this technology today if we had not studied science right but the bible has a special purpose by god to teach us and what is that purpose it is this the bible is a guide for life it is not a textbook on creation and science it is not a book to teach us whether you know bacteria and viruses and uh, proteins and dna and all no the the bible could not have because it was written to people at that time you see the bible doesn't even tell us properly whether the earth is moving round the sun or the sun is moving round the earth if you read the bible it appears that the sun is moving round the earth right and that is why when galileo came and he said look through the telescope people had a problem with him they were ready to kill him because they thought he was going against the bible and galileo said listen there is another book of god you know that god has two books one is the book which we call the bible so we study the bible to understand the wisdom of salvation that's what second timothy 3:14 says the bible gives us wisdom for salvation not how to understand theorems in mathematics or how to understand about bacteria what to do with bacteria that god has given the job to humans to figure out by yourself the bible did not tell us that we go around the sun it did not tell us about galaxies so the bible is a compass for life at a higher level at a meta level to guide us how to live science is going to not going to tell you what is good for you and whether you should live a life of sacrifice and love that science cannot tell that is a limitation of science so science has its limitation the bible also has its limitation especially when we are dealing now with uh, with uh, disease and things like that sometimes some christians would say we will pray and god will heal there is no need for medicine as if god is not involved in the whole world of medicine and uh, study of of uh, of and creation of medicine no this is also god's world god wants us to learn he did not put everything in the bible you go find out for yourself and thank god for scientists who have that vision that when i am studying creation when i am looking at the world through a telescope or through a microscope i am looking at god's creation and i want to learn 
and that is a process long process we have been learning so keep that in mind that when you are involved so if we do that this will happen we will recognize that god is working in every sphere of our world including in the field of medicine and technology we need to get our information from reliable sources unfortunately i'm sorry to say i know i have dear friends of mine who have all kinds of views about the vaccines and uh, and things like that what do we do i cannot change them i know but friends we need to look at god's world now i know all scientists don't need not believe in god but god can still god can still heal us through good medicine i know the field of medicine pharma, pharmaceuticals there is a lot of greed involved well there is a lot of greed everywhere we humans can become greedy pastors can become greedy so seeing god working in every field and rejoicing in that so if i go to the hospital and and by the way few years ago i had a heart attack and i had a medical intervention god used the doctors and god saved my life gave me few little more time to live in and serve in this world so first thing remember the bible is not a book for everything it is has a special limited purpose it gives us wisdom for salvation second timothy 3:14 the second thing remember that jesus is the capital w word of god now i am beginning to say i am not going to say that if you put a capital w before the bible for the bible as a word of god is wrong but i would like to prefer i would like to keep that capital w for jesus because that's what the bible says he is the word of god jesus is the word of god he was with god john 1:1 1, 1, right so we do not believe in the father son and holy bible <laughs> we believe in the father son and holy spirit the bible is not at all at the same level as god bible is not eternal the writings of the bible were written much later god is eternal however the bible is the message of god is the word of god written by god's people and we have to learn how to understand it and these writings will help us to follow the word of god so keep this in mind keep the bible in its proper place and keep jesus in his proper place and as we do this as we read the bible responsibly this will lead us to hope because you know the end of the story of the bible is a very hopeful story rather than fear about the future the bible is a compass pointing to revelation last two chapters a new heaven and new earth friends we are not going to just die and sometimes we say he has gone to his eternal home no that is not we are not going to heaven heaven is not our eternal home <laughs> the bible says god will give us a new body resurrected bodies that is the final hope and that is a new heaven and new earth that's why taking care of the earth also becomes important for us ecology environment becomes important because it's a pointer towards a new righteous age coming where we will live in but till that this is my last slide and after this we can have questions meanwhile we are groaning that's the language of romans 8 what a chapter that is what a chapter take time to read that chapter along with all creation creation is going groaning just like a woman is groaning in childbirth but what happens after that a baby is born so creation itself is groaning paul said the whole earth is groaning and part of the suffering of the earth and all that what is happening is part of the groaning and we wait we wait in prayer we wait in hope that one day the new heaven and new earth will be revealed that is the hope we are moving towards so even though we go through pandemics even though we bury our loved ones which is very painful our hope ultimately is in the resurrection and a new heaven and new earth that is what i believe a responsible interpretation of the bible will lead us to i have taken a lot of time and i hope uh we can spend some time i'm fine so depending on you uh, let's go for the questions and go ahead uh, 
uh, and ask me the questions. Thank you so much for the very insightful sharing that you did today. Uh, we already have a few questions on the chat box. So let me just- you uh, ask me the way you would like to. Go ahead, moderate it. Okay, uh, so we have a question from um, Nancy who wants to know how to, in, how, how to understand Proverbs 18.21, which says that the tongue has the power of life and death and those who love it will eat its fruit. Yeah, so one of the things about Proverbs is you need to recognize the genre of this writing. Proverbs are not giving you like a mathematical uh, statement. For example, any triangle, you write, put it in any way you want, the sum of its angles has to be exactly 180 degrees. That's an absolute reality, okay? Proverbs, when we speak in Proverbs, we are not talking about mathematical exactitude. So there is a problem that amongst us, we take a word like that and almost tell people that if we speak, the power is in the speech. And so some pastors will say, don't even confess. If you have cancer, don't say I have cancer. Say I'm healed. And how long will you keep on saying when you are healed because a day comes and you are lying in the coffin, your saying you are healed did not change it. So we have a wrong idea of this positive confession based on verses like that. So all I say is, recognize this is Proverbs. For example, Proverbs will say, a hoary head, a white head is a sign of wisdom. Wow, is that true? So everybody who gets white hair is becoming wiser. Then why is it that many of us who get wiser want to hide that by black magic? You know, we should just look wise. Uh, no, and there is no guarantee that, by the way, some of us like have lost our hair also. So what? So a statement in the Proverbs, recognize a, the genre you're reading. For example, you'll read about a metaphor, the sun will become dark in the moon. Many things is talked. In the, the fall of Babylon is spoken like that. Matthew 24, it talks about the fall of Jerusalem like that. The sun will turn down. Because that's a hyperbole. Because for the Jewish people, Jerusalem was light and sun and everything. And when Jerusalem was destroyed, it was as if the sun had become dark. Right? So Matthew 24 is not about some parts of those in the first part is not about the end. It is about the destruction of Jerusalem. It's already fulfilled. Okay, so just recognize the genre. Proverbs is beautiful. There is truth there, but not absolute truth. There is a truth involved in that. Right, thank you. Uh, thank you, Pastor Cherian. Uh, so there's another question, which is also on the same lines of interpretation. How do I interpret 1 Timothy 2.12 and 1 Corinthians 14.34? So you uh, now open my Bible or can you read those? Uh, how do you interpret, okay? What is it? 1 Timothy 2.12. Uh, 1 Timothy 2.12. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And 1 Corinthians 14 34. Ah, wonderful, wonderful. I knew that in a ladies group, you will ask me some of those questions about women and things like that. Very good. Now, let me say this. This is a major, major issue. And uh, maybe we need to have a special session for that. Uh, does the Bible prohibit women from leadership position? Does the Bible say women should be silent? I have been to very, very nice congregations where the woman does not come, is not allowed to come in the front, in the front of the pulpit and even lead in prayer. The only place she can lead in prayer may be in the Sunday school class. Now, because it's based on a certain reading of certain texts, which are, so I think we will have to, I'm not going to be able to answer this. I have written on this. Um, is Paul against women in uh, leadership, etc.? And um, that is found in a very nice book. For those who are interested, for the ladies here, you should pick up this book on Amazon. It is a book edited by Beulah Wood, a book called How I Changed My Mind on Women in Leadership. It's available through SIAX and uh, write it down and you can buy it on Amazon. How I Changed My Mind on Women in Leadership by edited by Beulah Wood, V-W-O-O-D. So in that I have a chapter. 
was uh, I go through all the Pauline texts. Remember, when Paul says something to a certain group of people, he is not telling that to 21st century people in, in, in Singapore or in New York or in Bangalore or in a village in India. He is not. He doesn't even know we exist. So we have to do the hard work of figuring out, again, author's intended meaning, audience's inducted meaning. Why did, for example, Paul say something to the women at Corinth in 1 Corinthians 11? Why did they women have to cover their heads when they were in public worship? Once you understand that, then you can ask the question, okay, that was the reason. Now, does that reason apply in our time? If it doesn't, we are not called to follow the Bible. Now, I'm going to shock you. I think it's about time I'm old enough now. If I don't say some of these things now, it'll be too late. We are not called to follow the Bible in that sense. We are called to follow Jesus. And a good reading of the Bible will help us to follow Jesus. And a bad reading of the Bible, you know, sometimes our Bible trumps Jesus. We can find a Bible verse to go against what Jesus said. Now that is how stupid can we get, right? So very, very important. Work hard on figuring out audience's inducted meaning. Why did the original audience? We are. This is not a verse given. Paul did not write this to us sitting today. However, still I let me come to that question. I want to say this is very quick. We need more time to explain through the process. Paul is writing to Timothy, his associate, who is in Ephesus. There are some special problems in Ephesus. Some women have gone overboard with their freedom in Christ. And what they have done is they have gone beyond cultural limitations. You see, there are cultural limitations in many places. If you are in Saudi Arabia, you cannot say, I'll wear short pants and walk around as a lady. Or I can walk around with my head uncovered. You have to, even today, there, follow cultural limitations. So was in Corinth. All respectful women covered their head in public. Now, that is not true of Bangalore, at least. My mother, when she walked through Bangalore, or my sister, or my wife walks through a Bangalore city, they don't cover their head. It's not accept needed to be considered respectful. So, that is a different world. Ours is a different world. So, sometimes some of these rules don't apply. However, part of our culture, maybe, we follow that, uh, we cover our heads or whatever. That's all right. That is part of our tradition. Now, what is Paul saying? He is specifically dealing, if you read this context, you will find it is specifically dealing with not women. Look at verse 9. Who are the women who have elaborate hairstyles or gold or pearls or expensive clothes? Not women. Rich women. Paul is specifically dealing not with women, but with rich women. Who are these rich women? Now, when you read the pastoral epistles, that is 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, Titus, and others, you find there is a nexus between false teachers and rich widows or women who have been abandoned. And they worm their way. You will read things like that. So what is happening? Some of these widows, some of these women, they are rich. And they somehow, without having gone through the pro proper process of being taught, suddenly want to take attention in the church. They want the, the, the freedom to speak and lead and teach without having been discipled or catechized or they've been taught. So Paul says, I don't allow that. And I would rather they learn probably, uh, you know, learn uh, humbly in a situation and then. So it is not about women. It is specially, specifically, look at the context, rich women. So Paul is not against women in leadership. You know, Paul had many, 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 many women leaders. Do you know he speaks about a woman apostle in Romans 16 verse 7? Junia. He mentions that she and her husband are considered as among the apostles. Oh, so you don't become an apostle without speaking, right? So Paul is not against women in speaking. This is a specific issue of a problem in Ephesus. See, that was written to them. So we have to understand that. Then we ask the question, so does it mean all women everywhere? Of course not. 
Paul himself says, you know, uh, Aquila and Priscilla mentioned six times in the in the in the in the New Testament, and four times it is Priscilla and Aquila. That means she was a leader, and you can't don't become a leader without speaking. So in the letters of Paul, you find many places where women spoke and were in leadership. So this is a specific instance which does not apply across the board. That was a short answer. I could speak for one hour. <laughs> so I think Cardilla could not join because of oh. some short circuit in her apartment. Oh no, yeah, I saw the lights going off. How sad. Okay, so let me take over. There is one question. Uh, I'm not, okay, there is just a comment. I thank you for your teaching today. It's becoming difficult to lead lay person in the biblical teaching as their faith are grounded much on feelings. Yes. Much on, sorry, sorry. As, their, as their faith are grounded much on feelings about a particular verse, how would you respond to help layman in the right knowledge of the Bible? Okay, good question. Um, I would say, see the I my basic feeling, my basic uh, conviction is the writings of the Bible were written to ordinary people. They were not rocket scientists. So I believe they did understand the original people did understand the basic message of the Bible. Now, there may be some nuances that everybody in the congregation may not have got. Just like sometimes if a person speaks and there is a joke and not everybody in the room gets it the first time and somebody else will say, hey, what did he say? Then he explains to the other, then everybody gets it. So it is possible for everybody to understand. You don't speak to an audience expecting them not to understand. So one of the things we have to teach our people is to read and I'm hoping there are some pastors here will learn this, to read the Bible, not verses. Our problem is, even preachers, we have all made that mistake. We take one verse from here, then jump to another verse from another book, then another verse from another book, and then connect to another verse, another book, and, then, and finally we, we say Jesus is coming in 2080. I did it at one time. And let me tell you, I am... I was intelligent when I was in college. I was studying integral calculus and all that. I could understand all that. Yet, when it came to the Bible, I did this jiggery pokery with the Bible. Took a text from here and there and came up with whatever. You know, Jesus is coming soon. Uh, I, I just happened to see one question about Israel. You know, one of the reasons why many people said Jesus is coming soon was because of what happened in 1948 the nationhood of the political nation of Israel. And so people said they connected the word, this generation will not pass away, mentioned in Matthew 24, with the fig tree meaning Israel. And therefore they said within 40 years, 1988. So in 1978, I have preached that Jesus will come before 1988 because of this view. But what Jesus was saying, this generation will not pass away, is not talking about 1948 plus generation. If that was so, nobody would ever understand it till 1948. You see, we miss the basic point. Jesus, the first whole part is about, Jesus said in Matthew 24 verse 2, this beautiful temple you are talking about will be destroyed, man. And the disciples said, when will that be? He said, this will happen in one generation. And sure enough, before 70 AD, the Jerusalem was destroyed. The fig tree is not about 1948 Israel. Of course, the question there is about Israel. That is another large question. How do we understand today's political Israel? And who is Jesus if he is not Israel? And that in Jesus, remember, I will just say one more word. This is about interpretation. John 15 verse 1, Jesus said, I am the true vine. What did Jesus mean by that? That also he could have said, I am the vine, you are the branches. But he said, I'm the true vine. And for understanding that, you need the second layer of culture. Psalm 80, verses 8 to 15, very, very clear. Psalm 80. You brought a vine out of Egypt. You planted it. You moved the other nations. Isaiah 5. The vineyard of the Lord Almighty is the household of Israel. 
So when Jesus is saying, I am the true Asli, that means there are other Nakli ones around. I am the true vine. You know what he's saying? I am the true Israel. There's a new Israel was God's plan always. And G the, since Israel kept on failing, Jesus comes to become Israel for us. So in Jesus, though, Israel is thrown open to everybody. Jew, Chinese, Africans, Brazilians, Indians too. That is what we see. There's not, uh, it is God expanding the whole idea of Israel. Now, what is a modern state of Israel? Nothing about that is mentioned in the Bible. But we have to deal with that. That's a huge issue. I have been dealing with some pastors working on that. That will require more time. But uh, I forget your original question. I think I answered that. Okay, next. One other question is here. What about the promises that we claim from the Bible? So promises are just one verse. So how to go about it? Yeah, uh, good question. Promises must be claimed. But they, they, we should claim the promises given to us. If a promise was specifically given to Abraham, maybe in some ways it may be promise given to us. You know, certain promise was given, you'll have a child, even in your old age. And you could find that and some people will say, God will give me a child, God will give me, and they wait for too long. They could have had three children if they wanted to have adopted. Why not? So the idea of just taking a random verse and saying, God gave me a promise is problematic sometimes. I am not going to say God never speaks that way. No, I'm not going to say that. But what happens comes is we think we open the Bible, every verse is a flat platform. Every verse is equal. No. And every so-called verse is not a promise. What about the promise, you know, that, that is negative? Why don't we take, say that is for us? No, that is, that is not for us. So we are very choosy. This is what is called, you know, uh, what is the word for it? Uh, lucky dip method. You know, you pick up whatever you want. So friends, <coughs> Read the Bible. Let us not read verses. So if you're reading the Gospel of Luke, please read the whole Gospel. Try to figure out what it says. Don't read one verse out of context. So that is the basic problem we have. We read a verse, take a promise, and what happens when that promise doesn't work? That is, we are using the word Bible sometimes as a talisman. You know, I have been in prayer groups where somebody is unwell and somebody will say, somebody will declare, I declare that person is healed. He's already healed. And we just will wait for the manifestation of the healing. And they kept on saying, I also said, Lord, we are praying. And I sincerely prayed. And then when that person dies, this person who said they are healed, they were healed, said, oh, sincere condolences. Good. That's all right. But what happened? I thought he was already healed, right? So how do we understand uh, this? So taking random verses, promises, that's not the way. So we have to learn. Read the text carefully. Read the Gospels carefully. Read the letters of Paul carefully. Sometimes we say, oh, if you, you know, cover yourself in the blood of Jesus, you will never have an accident. So when somebody else has an accident, you say, oh, they, you know, they did not pray enough or they didn't have faith enough or whatever. It's easy to say that when it happens to somebody else. But read Paul. Do you know how many shipwrecks he had? Do you think he had shipwrecks because he didn't pray or cover himself by the blood of Jesus? You know, sometimes we see people with the driving a car at the back. I am covered in the blood of Jesus. The car is covered or the driver is covered. Okay, good. What you're saying is, you know, in a language that most people don't understand, uh, that you believe in Jesus. Fine. But we don't take random promises like that. God is with us. God is with us even when we have an accident. And even when we have tragedy, even when we have cancer, God doesn't leave us. We are living in a broken world. That's why I said at the very end, we are living in a world where we are to get grown. We will not get all we want in this present age. In this present age, God is working in us to make us more like Jesus because a next age is coming. That is what the Bible talks about. The new heaven and new earth. 
Revelation 21, 22. All right. So next question, does the call of God keep on changing in our life? Is missionary or pastor a special calling or theological studies a special calling? Very good question. Excellent question. Um, yeah. First of all, I want, I, I feel very strongly about this point. So I'm glad that there's somebody asked this question. The word calling. Now, let me ask a question. Many times in India, we use the word vocational training, right? Most of the time, this word vocational training is used to talk about, you know, some uh, lower level training, yeah, woodwork, electrical work, carpentry, plumbing, why we feel some people need to be trained to do that, which is good. Those are jobs that are needed. But we use the word vocational only for these kind of works. We don't use the word vocational training if you're training to be a doctor or an engineer. We don't use that because we don't understand how to understand that word vocation. So let me define the word vocation to you. Think of the English word vocal. It has to do with the sound, right? Vocation, this was something that in the 16th century, the, the reformers talked a lot about. They talked about God calling everybody. Everybody was called in their understanding of vocation. Vocation means you're calling. And God calls. Now, you and I say, Lord, give us this day our daily bread, right? How did that daily bread come? I have not grown any wheat and rice for anybody in my life. So it will not come through pastors and preachers. Because God calls the farmers. They grow the food. And many times you don't recognize them as doing God's work. And then somebody has to transport it. Then somebody has to do the whatever work has to be doing in packing. And then finally for us, if we are to get bread, it comes into a shop. Somebody has to make it. And then shopkeeper has to sell it. And finally we get it and we say, thank you, Lord, for giving us bread. How did God do it? And by keeping the word calling only to a few people who are given a special status, full-time is not even biblical. For example, Apostle Paul, of course, he was a great apostle, but if you read 1 Thessalonians 2, 9, he tells them, I was with you and night and day, not day and night, that is the Jewish way, is night and day, I worked so that I will not put a financial burden on you. Now, night and day, if Paul is working on leather work, that was his work, then when is he doing the court's ministry? Right? Paul was doing ministry also night and day. So this idea of so-called full-time is a luxury, a modern understanding. Now, God may call some people to focus on certain things. So I believe I felt the calling. I wanted to be a physicist. That's what I wanted to be. My mother was a maths teacher. I was going, I did maths and I thought I was going to be a physicist, but God sends a call. I came to seminary. So I was called to become a student of the Bible and teacher of the Bible. That is my special calling. Some of you are called to be school teachers. Some of you are called to be business people. Some of you are called to be doctors and nurses and businessmen and CEOs of companies or whatever, airline pilots. So this is our calling. But all of us must find out God's calling. A pastor's calling is never higher than an auto rickshaw's calling, rickshaw driver's calling. If that auto rickshaw driver recognizes, and I have had, I remember in Hyderabad, there was a, a, a young man who was taking me around. He was a taxi driver. I tell you, his love for Jesus was unmatched. I don't know whether even pastors, when they talk about, you know, when they talk for one hour, whether that love for Jesus comes out. I'm not convinced everybody has that love for Jesus. But here, what was his calling? He's a taxi driver. So all of us are called. Some may be called to do certain things. And many times our life situations, some of us got better educational opportunities. God will work with what we have. But all of us can serve God. There will be no special line with God of those who are pastors and preachers like me. 
Thank all you. to serve God. Yes. Thank you so much. Actually, uh, this question I have also struggled with. Um, in between some five years back, I thought I should leave my job as a scientist and join some organization like RZIM or something. And yeah, sometimes yeah. I tried to join. Uh, people came, God sent to times people to tell that you can be a missionary in your own place. So that helped me. So I understand that you can be a missionary in every place, wherever God puts you. So thank you so much for that answer. So now another question. Um, can I tell you one more thing to that answer? Today, in fact, yesterday I was in a conversation with several leaders. And we are saying that today for missionary work, we can't just have a person go to a new place and say they are a missionary and they receive money from the missionary board. Because the people will ask, who are you? They can't say I'm a missionary. And you're sitting at home and your uh, money is coming and you're a missionary. We need people who are doing something, who are having a vocational calling to go to an unreached place, either as a school teacher or a dentist or an accountant or a you know scientist or a doctor or a nurse or whatever. Go there and be a missionary. Because this idea of full-time missionary is not going to work for a long time. And uh, so we, uh, I tell people, go, become a school teacher. <clears throat> and you will have interaction with many people and that is a good way to be a missionary. Yes, maybe sometimes some of us had the privilege, uh, it's a luxury just to pursue, you know, studying of the Bible and others, not having to do any other so-called job. Yeah. Uh, uh, Pastor Jacob, I have another uh, call. Uh, that's why I pitched in. I, I just want to ask you a very quick question. You know, in uh, hermeneutics, uh, I used to say while studying the scripture before interpreting your verse, we must give due consideration to the context, cultural habits, historic and social background during biblical times, applying common sense, using the knowledge of language and grammar and understand the poetic and figurative statement in the scripture, like, you know, figurative in Revelation and all. I understand. So slavery is not condemned in the Old and New Testament laws and all. You know, you know that. Right? I cause uh, stumble. I have to cut it off. We can't take it literally. Otherwise, uh, you know, it says you. Okay. Uh, do not wear clothing woven uh, of two kinds of material for, uh, you know, uh, it's uh, Leviticus 19 says. That's why I addressed the point of... Paul, can you come to your question? Because I, I... I'll, I'll come to the question by now. You know, in the Old, Old Testament laws, you know, uh, the the my uh, important question is, uh, Christians are not at all required to fulfill the civil and ceremonial laws in the Old Testament, but are bound to obey the moral laws of uh, old and uh, which is told in the Old and New Testament laws. I'll tell you why. Uh, you know, because uh, the uh, Ten Commandments it's to please God and obey God, for example, and then uh, the to worship God and atone for sin sacrificial system, which we don't follow now. And then, the, 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 you know, that uh, dress, you know, food and clothing, it is only for Israelites at that point of time. So my question is, in my, you know, hermeneutics uh, blog, I wrote, uh, Old Testament law do not apply now at all, because Roman 10, 4 says, for Christ is the end of the law, for righteousness to everyone who believes. My question is to Dr. Jacob, Am I right if I say the Old Testament law do not apply to us now? Because Christ says, you know, in the, in Matthew, that if you love your neighbor and yes, if you I love God, God everything is completely, you know, fulfilled after, uh, you know, in the new covenant. Am I right? Brother Paul, uh, Brother Paul, I think the convener wanted you to ask, send the question to her anyway. Let me, you you obviously know what you're saying and I agree with what you're saying. There are aspects of the Old Testament law that were part of the covenant with a specific group of people. A covenant is always between two groups of people. One is God and uh, Israel. And so Israel had to follow all those. Now, we are not that ethnic Israel living in Canaan. So obviously, many of those laws do not apply to us. But yes, uh, a lot of the moral and ethical laws continue because God's character is reflected. But however, even those laws which we don't have to exactly follow, 
teach us for example how what do we do with a hebrew slave after six years you have to let that person go on and you see and you learn a lot about god's character through many of those laws thank you uh, go ahead uh, lata if you have oh, any i other... have one important question many times thank he has you. put it here um, he he is asking pastor cherian do you say that there is no biblical relevance to modern day israel and the current events around that nation uh, can you relate any current world events accurately in the light of scriptures okay uh, how much time do i have lata how many hours do i have to answer that question <laughs> uh, just you have just two days ago i spent time with a few pastors on the same question now these are all huge issues and for many of us our views about these have developed and been formed over years and there is no way i can come and tell you something that you have become uh, solidified about in one line or the other however i will still very simply in india we like to use the word in my humble opinion i won't say that but in my opinion uh, the word we need to understand the role of israel in scripture and we need to understand that scripture was fulfilled in jesus how now i let me be very honest it took me many years to see that actually jesus is israel the purpose of god choosing abraham was to bless the whole world abraham then his grandson israel the people of israel continue to fail but god never gave up and that is why when you read the story of the gospels each of the gospel writers has their own way of connecting with the story of israel see how matthew does it the son of david son of abraham jesus is israel and what does matthew 2 to 11 i think not 11 215 or something it says uh, he quotes from hosea 11 one out of uh, out of egypt i call my son ah but hosea 11 one is talking about israel but it's here is talking about jesus's family jesus as a baby so jesus is israel john the baptizer comes to baptize he calls israel to repent and jesus comes and stands before him and john says hello sorry cousin it's not for you and jesus says john sorry you don't understand yet you are calling israel i am standing in place of israel and that is why jesus came and took baptism not christian baptism so that we will take baptism he took baptism on behalf of israel repentant israel on their behalf and then he went into the wilderness 40 days just like israel went into the wilderness and while israel grumbled and failed jesus overcame so many 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 passages if you read the gospels well what you realize is and that is what the disciples who grew up like good jews did not understand they kept thinking of physical when are you going to bring the kingdom even in the book of acts they say they don't understand because jesus has now thrown open the kingdom of god in a unexpected way even the messiah the whole israel was even today modern israel which is there are a few people there modern israel is not necessarily very religious many of the educated people do not even believe in god they are culturally jewish and those who are very waiting for the messiah what kind of messiah do they expect a a political messiah who will kick out the enemies but jesus said guess what i am a different messiah i am the messiah i am going to be kicked by the romans and peter took him aside and rebuked him why because they were they have been taught from generations a certain way of reading the scriptures so you and i have to read the old testament through jesus luke 24 jesus says how everything in the tanakh that is a torah nevim ketubim was fulfilled how that <coughs> jesus would be the suffering messiah that suffering messiah is what they struggled with stumbled with remember paul puts it how a crucified messiah is a stumbling block to the 
Gentiles and it is sorry foolishness to the Greeks and stumbling block. Why? Because of the Bible. The Bible is a stumbling block. Bible says anyone on a tree is cursed. And so what is the role of Israel? Let me ask you, if we were living 100 years ago, okay, we are in 1921, what question would we have asked about this? This question was not even possible. So this question, if we are saying only makes sense to us because now we have come, it is some kind of prophecy that is one reading of the Bible. I grant it to you, but I think it is not the best reading of the Bible. I think I'll leave it at that. We can have a whole session on Israel later on. Yeah, one more day. I think so many people are want to hear from you, I feel. So we will have one more session of yours. Right now, an important question that, uh, can you recommend any good books on interpreting the book of Revelation by any good authors or theologians? Yes, very good. So I was waiting for this kind of question. Those who have pens to write down, please get your paper and pen ready. I'm, I can give you a hundred things. I won't give you a hundred because you will not be able to do them. Let me start with telling you how. Even today, one of my own relatives, I, I gave this advice to them. Are you ready? Okay. Now, freely online, there are some of the best resources are available online. But let me also say, some of the most sorry, sad, bad resources are also freely available. So if you pick up one of those and you think like that, you are not trained. First of all, we need to be trained how to read the Bible. So let me give you one of the best resources freely available today. Number one, on YouTube, you will find a series of short videos by Bible Project. Now, some of you may have come across that. If not, please write it down. Bible Project. And in that Bible Project, there is a series called How to Read the Bible. So, Bible Project, How to Read the Bible. There are 19 short videos in that set. All of them five, six minutes. Very short. How to read Psalms, how to read poetic literature, how to read apocalyptic literature. Okay, so if you want to get a better than a Bible college, you know, uh, kind of exposure in that short limited time, take those videos, open it in a nice device, sit with a notebook and take notes. So even though it's a five minute video, it may take you half an hour to get the main points. Okay, go through those 19 videos, short videos, five, six minutes. You will learn so much of the Bible and you say, oh my, why didn't I learn this? And uh, you will say, I wish my pastor also could hear this. <laughs> because we pastors do the best we can. We are sincere people, but sometimes we are not being guided well. So first thing, Bible project videos. Secondly, just want to remind you, Thankfully, it's amazing. This Bible project videos have now been translated, many of them, not all, into many Indian languages. Hindi, Gujarati, Telugu, Tamil, Malayalam, Bengali, Kannada. Not all, but you have a few. So type Bible project Kannada. You may find a few uh, videos. Hindi, you will find quite a few videos in Hindi. So you can, you know, share with people who don't understand English. But I'm assuming many of you here or most of you here understand good English. So you can please learn from that. Now, the guy behind that, the main uh, theological person behind that is a scholar, is an Old Testament scholar called, write his name down because he also, if you type his name, you will get a lot of videos. Tim, T-I-M, Mackie. M-A-C-K-I-E, M-A-C-K-I-E, Tim Mackey. Okay, now let me also tell you, I only told, told you about the short videos, 19 videos, but every single book of the Bible, let's say you're read, trying to read Ecclesiastes, okay? You're trying to figure that out. Just type Bible Project Ecclesiastes. You are trying to read Philippians, Bible Project Philippians. Revelation, Bible Project Revelation. Guess what? You will find two short videos, 
1 is till verses chapters 1 to 11 and then from 12 12 to 21 and if you sit down slowly with your bible those short videos it will take a little longer if you are trying to look at the text you will learn a lot from these uh, from these uh, videos okay so bible project videos are foundational simple next and sometimes this is at a little higher level there is a series called the seed bed s e e d b e t seed bed videos now you will see a sign of a of a green leaf and all that they have about 600 videos there amazing subject wise some of them may be for example genesis 1 you know there is a wonderful old testament professor she is explaining that there are two short videos most of the videos are between 6 to 10 minutes and uh, you can they're really good really good there are 600 or so videos a seed bed this comes out of asbury seminary which is an evangelical methodist evangelical seminary some of the finest scholars of all sides of all uh, you know uh, branches are giving there so you asked about revelation start with this book uh, this thing the other book if you want to talk about that i would recommend is it is called breaking the code i don't like that title but breaking the code is um, is uh, is a good book but it is not easily available but you may be able to buy it online the re there is a revised version now so breaking the code by the author original author bruce b r u c e metzger m e t z g e r metzger m e t z g e r bruce metzger so that is a very readable commentary or a very simple commentary on 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 the on the book of revelation but these um, lectures of um, um, of revelation are there then there is a series of short lectures by two yale professors uh, so if you type yale uh, revelation chapter one or something like that these are short about 10 12 15 minute short videos of each section uh, uh, harry attridge and um, i forget the other person's name two old yale professors are you know just opening bible and talking you can learn from that so start with these simple uh, you know uh, search in these places you will find a very good uh, helpful ways there are different ways of interpreting the book of revelation there are four ways there are very many popular ways most of these popular ways which i at one time followed is you read into revelation you see here is and i preached that at one time friends i'm honest you see you see ah oh, see this is television now can you imagine anyone reading the bible or a book of revelation till the time of television ever coming to the conclusion so are we saying that the book of revelation is only for us not for the people before us before television and computer that is an interesting statement to make i think that is an unwise one so we need to learn first of all what was the message to the first century readers and then take the message to ourselves usually in principle form okay so have i I have done so what... ask only one question and then we can finish it. What about the interpretation of tongues? Is it genuine? Uh, that's what someone is asking. So with that, we can finish it and then... Uh, yeah, this is a completely different kind of uh, topic. Uh, how do I present this? Obviously, there's a lot of confusion about spiritual gifts. There are sincere Christians who believe that the spiritual gifts ended in the first century. Such people sometimes are called cessationists, meaning they believe sincerely that all those, those gifts are over. So there are very many sincere Christians, and I have preached in those churches, uh, who believe those spiritual gifts finished. So what you see today are not real spiritual gifts. Uh, and I am 
I will, I will say, stake my life on this, that they are wrong. They are wrong. That doesn't mean they are not Christians or they are not sincere, they don't have salvation, no. But they are 100% wrong. Very simple. It is a certain reading of the Bible based on what is called, now this requires more explanation, I don't have the time for that, dispensational reading. One very, very popular uh, preacher who has a lot of following, uh, a dear brother, when I say he's my brother, I disagree with him, is John MacArthur. And he is a sincere brother. He's not a scholar. Okay, just because he has written or somebody has helped him to write, maybe sometimes uh, a lot of writing. But because of his theological scheme that he puts on it, he has come to that. If you read Paul, obviously he says, I speak in tongues more than you all. People who don't come from that background have no problem with the gift of the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues. I have heard, my parents came from a very old traditional mainline church which comes from the south called the Marthama Church. And I remember the bishop, one bishop, uh, Esau Marthamotheus, who actually one day preached and said, we should be filled with the Holy Spirit and speak in tongues. In a Marthama, my father was shocked sitting beside me. So why is he able to say that is because he does not follow dispensationalism. Secondly, the Archbishop of Canterbury, this is the Anglican Church, He's not a Pente they will not call himself a Pentecostal, Archbishop of Canterbury, one of the most famous biblical scholars today is a man called N.T. Wright. Okay, All of these people openly, there are videos saying openly they speak in tongues, they don't make a fuss about it, but they speak in tongues, it's part of their regular prayer life. So speaking in tongues is not a big deal, it is not a sign of spirituality, Neither is not speaking in tongues a sign of spirituality. So tongues are a gift and I believe it's open to the whole world. I have Anglican bishop friends of mine who speak in tongues. There are Methodists who speak in tongues. There are people within the Roman Catholic Church who speak in tongues. And there are others, of course, among the groups called the Pentecostal, Charismatic, there is. So the, if the question was, are tongues genuine? Why not? And... Uh, and uh, so I believe in speaking tongues. I do. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Pastor Jacob Chilian. So can we finish it with a prayer? Can you pray for all of us who are here? Yes. <clears throat> Friends, I know when I, even when I do my classes, sometimes my students leave with more questions than they had when they came because I've shaken their way of looking at scripture. Well, all I'm saying is read the Bible the way it was given to us, not in disjointed verses. That is a disease that I have given a name to, versitis. And we need to be healed of versitis. We need to read the Bible, not verses. So I know I have not answered all your questions. Some of you have been pressing, what about this verse, what about that verse, uh, etc., etc. And uh, so that's good. But, and you have many, many of your patent questions in your spiritual journey. Remember, very important. We are not saved because we have our theology and all our ideas right. Okay, We are not saved by the accuracy of our beliefs. We are saved by the efficacy of what Jesus did on the cross. Ultimately, let us follow Jesus with all our heart. We may not agree on everything about everything. I have no problem with those who do not speak in tongues or do not believe in speaking tongues. They are my brother. They are wrong, I believe, but that's all right. They are still my brother and sister. So the most important thing is keep thinking, keep rethinking, keep learning, keep on learning. But most important, we are all called to be fellow disciples of the Lord Jesus. So wherever you are in your journey, keep looking for good resources to learn from and uh, find those good resources and keep learning. All right. May the Lord bless us. Shall we pray? Gracious Father, we thank you for this opportunity we had to engage in thinking and dialogue. I know, Lord, we have many, many questions still. 
But the most important question is, how do we respond to you when you say, come, follow me? Jesus said, come and learn from me. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For my yoke is light and my burden is light. My yoke is easy. Help us, Lord, to learn from you. Help us to follow you with all our heart, soul, mind and strength. Thank you for each of my brothers and sisters. Lord, in each of their journeys, in their questions, in their struggles, some of them going through difficulties and pains and their questions are not just academic. They are struggling with life. Lord, comfort them. Holy Spirit, come and guide them, strengthen them, we pray. And today, our learning will only encourage us to be faithful disciples of our Lord Jesus. Let your Holy Spirit come upon each one, our families. Guide us, Lord, and make us a blessing to others as we share the love of Christ around us during these difficult times. Fill us with hope that we have in Jesus and help us to be carriers of this wonderful hope to those around us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor Jacob. Thank you.